Welcome to Budget Types. A third type of budget format is the performance budget, and it relies upon the use of non-financial performance measures that are related to the services being performed. For example, a laboratory budget involves a number of staff members using their scheduled hours along with supplies. Those are inputs to the production of the service. By themselves, they don't offer much guidance regarding the lab's performance and effectiveness. Tracking indicators showing the demand for services can help, as in, what is the target group's susceptibility to the disease? An example of a workload measure is the number of clients served. Productivity gets at the cost per patient served, and we'll discuss that in a minute. Effectiveness is measured from the customer's perspective, as in the percent of patients who have improved wellness. But in some cases, wellness may be too hard to measure, or something that requires more follow-up than, than the lab can do. Maybe you'd measure survival in years after an HIV diagnosis, or at least the reduction in the average viral load in a group of patients being tracked over time. Another effectiveness measure would be a survey to assess what the client felt about the services performed. Continuing our hypothetical example of data from both the line item and program budget formats, this format gets at the concept of productivity. This particular prevention program wanted to know its total costs. Taking total costs and dividing by the number of units of service performed, they get a per unit cost for prevention services. What questions arise when you look at this display? You might ask, where did the total cost amount come from? Or what types of units are being counted and how do you interpret the per unit cost? As we'll point out, assumptions are made for each row. Perhaps you remembered that the program budget showed that the prevention program had an allocation of 25. So why is it 35 here? The difference between the 25 and 35 will be explained on the next slide but essentially the prevention program will drive costs and other budgeted programs. Therefore, to drive the total cost to the organization for this prevention program housed in our laboratory department, we need to make some adjustments explained on the next slide. The number of units shown here could represent the number of villages where meetings were conducted to promote preventive behavior among the target group. The assumption is that each meeting is similar. But that could be a fatal flaw, because in one village the meetings might include only a few people, but in another village the same amount of time was spent helping a very large audience of people. It's neither fair nor accurate to treat these two units equally. Moreover, there may be other non-financial measures that should be counted, in addition to the number of meetings. In government and the service sector, it's hard to pin down just one performance measure that adequately captures a causal connection between spending money on that service and getting a desired result. That problem leads many organizations to count and report in the budget so many performance measures that the exercise loses its real value. For our purposes here, we assume that there is one indicator that matters the most, and so we track and count it. Per unit costs are simply the total cost divided by the number of units. Such calculations produce unit costs that range from 2.17 to 3.70, and then they change to 3.50 for the next budget year. It would help if there were comparable per unit costs derived across many different laboratories around the country. Alternatively, perhaps there are private industry standards that could be used for comparison. Such comparisons would provide a way to assess the value of the calculated amounts. Otherwise, these numbers may generate interesting budget review questions, but not a solid basis to drive budget decisions. If the laboratory department is part of a much larger organization, then it makes sense to determine which parts of those other departmental budgets are driven by the laboratory department's direct activities. While the direct cost, as shown earlier, is 25, 
there are 10 in indirect or allocated costs. These overhead elements will be found in other budgets, such as the accounting and finance department spending $2 of the accounting budget and $3 of the purchasing budget going towards processing payroll and purchases made by the laboratory prevention program. Within the laboratory department, $3 of the leadership budget and $2 of the testing budget represent expenses that would no longer be needed if the prevention program was ended. These allocated overhead amounts could be determined by a number of methods. For the accounting department, the number of checks written on behalf of the prevention program as a share of all written checks could be used to allocate to the prevention program a share of the accounting department's budget. Maybe part of the testing program's budget in terms of staff time is used to promote prevention, thereby making it appropriate to allocate that amount. Let's say $2 to the prevention program. It just happens that the $2 is part of the testing program. But if the prevention program was no longer part of the organization's mission, then theoretically that $2 would no longer be needed and could be eliminated. Now whether or not that $2 would be eliminated depends upon its nature. If what is allocated is part of the wages for a person who mainly provides testing services, and also provide some prevention services, it may be unlikely that the person would be let go merely because of the loss of the prevention program. More than likely, that person's slack time would be devoted instead to providing only testing services. As a result, the time previously devoted to prevention services would no longer be tracked and accounted for as prevention. Performance budgeting requires the use of non-financial performance measures. The problem, as stated earlier, is that service-oriented organizations are unsure which performance measures mean the most. In the face of that uncertainty, there's the tendency to count and report many different measures. When that occurs, there's no way to get a pure unit cost amount that matters. Benchmarking performance in one program to similar programs run by competing or similar organizations is valuable. It helps to have industry standards, but that's not always available. But making comparison across labs can be very helpful in identifying effective practices. To start with, it helps to classify performance measures by program function. Performance budgeting should get managers to focus on productivity and results instead of the budget inputs. While financial numbers are often subject to financial audits by accountants, the introduction of non-financial indicators into the budget process exceeds the, the accountant's technical expertise. Despite this limitation, non-financial indicators should be documented so that they can be audited as well, not by accountants, but by outsiders who know how to interpret and check the data. In doing so, they'll look at the original source of the data as well as the procedure used to collect it. To give you an example of how problems can arise, let's talk about emergency response times. Assume you have a department that wants to measure its performance using response times. The shorter the response time, the better they're doing. But the important question arises, when will the response time clock start? When the call first comes in? Or when the emergency helper leaves the office heading to the emergency site? When does the clock end? When the emergency helper arrives on the scene? Or when the helper first touches the patient? There has to be a uniform and consistent start and end definition, or else the response time simply doesn't make sense. A uniform approach is required for all emergency departments if the goal is to compare emergency response times across settings, whether it's for different emergency helpers, different budget years, or other organizations for comparison. Fundamentally, the auditing of performance and performance data provides the same degree of comfort as does financial auditing. A fourth budget format to consider is zero-based budgeting, also known as ZBB. 
The way ZBB works is that an organization is divided into as many subunits or programs as there's a desire to track costs for individually. In our current example, that would mean four subunits or programs. For each program, a series of spending plans, referred to as packages, are prepared. A basic package will reduce the spending to the bare minimum, not necessarily what was budgeted or spent in recent years. The idea of the basic package is to reflect the bare necessities only, thereby keeping the program alive. Then, other packages are created which would contain improvements or enhancements to that minimum program package. The staff in each program or subunit does the work of dividing all of the current and future plans into separate discrete packages. Each package specifies a range of costs to implement a particular plan. Because it's done by frontline staff in each unit, this type of budgeting is typically referred to as bottom up budgeting. Now, after all the packages have been created, there's a comparison and ranking of all the packages based upon organization priorities. The final approved budget will adopt and fund as many of the packages as possible, but perhaps not all given the limited funding that's available for the new budget year. Now let's look at this hypothetical example of a prioritized zero-based budget set of packages for the laboratory department. There are basic minimum packages for each of the four programs, but the priority is to fund increment A of testing service ahead of even the basic minimum prevention service. This illustrates the value of ZBB as it forces a prioritization within and across all programs. In this hypothetical example, if there were only enough available resources to budget for packages one through six, then they'd be able to fund the basic minimum of each of the four programs, as well as implement the additional first increment of two of the programs. All other packages would have to wait for a future budget year of funding in order to be implemented. Zero-based budgeting makes each program defend its existence. Priorities are set at each level in the budget review process. This budget reform provides an opportunity to break with traditional budgeting and spending by forcing a look at minimum program activities and placing all the rest of recent spending areas and future plans into separate decision packages for consideration. At each level of review, up to and including the top level of review, there's a strong possibility of zeroing out some elements of current spending as the organization's priorities change. A criticism of zero-based budgeting is that it's very time-consuming to develop the decision packages and to conduct the prioritization process annually. In conclusion, budget allocations can be made with different budget designs. There's no one best way. It depends on what the organization wants to do. The line item budget is more control oriented. Most individuals can interpret the line items to see what the money is going to be spent on. All the other budget designs require more interpretation because they move away from control to goal oriented evaluation budgeting. Moreover, remember that you can change budget formats over time. If one isn't working for your organization, you can always implement another.